You can have a seat. So I am Pastor Pete. I'm the Life Group Pastor here. Um, I'm not normally the one up here, but I am glad to be here with you guys today. Uh, we will be, thank you. Thank you for my one fan. Um, oh, okay. Hey, we're going to be in Philippians chapter four. So if you wanna open your Bibles to Philippians four, uh, if you're using the Bible in the seat in front of you, that's gonna be on page 1166. And of course, you're welcome to take that Bible home with you. If you need a Bible to read throughout the week, it can be yours. So please take that if you would like. So we're gonna be in Philippians 4. While you're all finding that, I wanna tell you a little story. Um, in 2017, we took our family on a dream vacation to Walt Disney World, okay? And we had a lot of stuff planned. Like it was like two days in every one of the parks. And I think it was on our second day, we were just um, heading from one attraction to the next and child number one pipes up and says in a whiny voice, I wanna do something. <laughs> and I'm like, we are doing something. We're at Walt Disney World. <laughs> Come on, let's go. So we get a few more steps down the road and then child number two says, I wanna eat something. I'm like, we just ate, we just ate. Come on, let's go. So, you know, we're, we're going through the park and we get maybe, you know, 10 minutes down the way and um, child number three says, I wanna buy something. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, we're at Walt Disney World. We can't afford anything else. <laughs> but, but that mantra, I wanna do something, I wanna eat something, I wanna buy something, and I think the other one was, I wanna go somewhere, became the slogan for our time at Walt Disney World. And it proved something to me. Uh, we as people are very good at complaining, and even uh, in the happiest place on earth, we have a hard time finding contentment. Um, and I'm further proving that we're good at complaining, being up here complaining about my kids complaining. <laughs> um, we carry this propensity to complain into our relationships. If we're single, um, we might be thinking, hey, you know, cooking for one, it's not that much fun. Or we might think, you know, I could probably have some more fun if I had somebody to share my day with. We have lots of ways that we can complain about being single, thinking that's not really what I wanna do. Um, and then if we happen to be single and then get married, we carry that complaining streak into our marriage. Um, you know, we think, wow, this spouse has a lot more annoying habits than I thought they did. Um, you know, and, and we, begin to find reasons to complain even in our marriage relationship. Um, that is human nature. It is human nature to find something to complain about. It is human nature to find something to be discontent about. But um, I think what we're gonna see today is that God has a different way for us to live. He has a better way for us to live in our relationships. So that's what we're gonna see today in Philippians 4. So if you've got Philippians 4 open, go down to verse 11. We're gonna stick, you know, the most of the points are coming from 11, 12, and 13, but we're gonna look at some other verses in Philippians 4 as well. So Philippians 4, starting in verse 11, Paul wrote, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So what we see right there in verse 11 is that contentment is learned contentment is learned. Paul says that he learned he needed to be content. So I, I see this kind of as two sides of this. One, he's living life and he's like, I need to learn how to be content in my life. And then he had to learn how to be content. 
And I think it's interesting that sometimes we feel maybe justified in our lack of contentment. We think things are so bad that we deserve to be unhappy. Maybe your list sounds like this. I've been single so long, it isn't fair that I'm still single. Or maybe I'm not the one who wanted to be single. My spouse is the one who divorced me. Or we might say stuff to ourselves like, I was once happily married, and now I'm all alone. And when we look at the circumstances surrounding our singleness, we feel like complaining is the right response. Maybe you feel justified in your lack of contentment in your marriage. Maybe that once happy, fun-loving, and affectionate husband is now distant and not as much fun to be around. Maybe you weren't bargaining for all the opinions that your wife was ready to share with you. Um, one, one of my favorite stories about marital discontent and learning how to be content has to do with cupboard doors being left open. Um, you're laughing, but this is a serious situation, okay? So um, this couple had been married for several years and the wife had this notorious bad habit of leaving cupboard doors open. So I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Sixth Sense, but you know there's that scene where you walk into the kitchen and every cupboard door is mysteriously open, right? Spooky in the movie, but in this man's life, he was getting really, really tired of coming home and seeing every cupboard door open. And this got on his nerves so much that he was finally ready to call it quits. He's like, I'm done. I don't want to deal with this anymore, and he's ready to end the marriage over it. And he decided to find out what it would take for him to be content in his marriage. So he timed himself, and he went around and he closed every cupboard door. And he found out that in about 90 seconds a day, he could return his house to a livable situation. 90 seconds a day, he could learn contentment and he could be content. And that's what he chose to do, rather than ending the relationship. That's a fun story, but Paul learned that he needed to be content as well. Circumstances in life can be hard, and they can be far more serious than cupboard doors being left open. When you look at your circumstances, do you see that you need some more contentment? Because it's not natural. Humanly speaking, contentment is very unnatural, but God wants us to learn to be content in all areas of our life, in our relationship, in our finances, in our living situation, in all areas, he wants us to be content. So what is this contentment? How do we define it? Tony Evans has a nice definition in the curriculum we've been doing on singleness. He describes contentment this way to be at ease where you are until you get where you want to be. To be at ease where you are until you get where you want to be. I like that. Like, I like that, that phrase, just to be at ease, right? Contentment is the sense of being at ease. I think from Philippians 4, we might also define contentment as this. Contentment brings joy in all circumstances. Contentment brings joy in all circumstances. Look again at verse 12. Paul wrote, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So he describes all these different circumstances, right, where he had learned the secret of facing them with contentment. So what is this contentment? What is the secret? If you look up a few verses just at uh, verse 4 in Philippians 4, you see it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Okay, you probably have heard that verse before. Maybe if you grew up in church, you sang the song about rejoicing in the Lord always. Um, I think that that is what contentment is, and it says always. Like, Always, we can be rejoicing. Um, in every circumstance, we can be content. And 
that is a pretty high bar, if you ask me. Especially when we look at life and we think about all of the difficulties that we have to face, being joyful always and being content in every circumstance, that seems pretty high. And so you might question, well, can the Apostle Paul really speak to us about this? I mean, does he really understand how difficult my life is? And the answer is absolutely yes. He totally understands. The Apostle Paul um, was a missionary who traveled much of the Roman Empire, and he had a difficult ministry. Multiple times, people uh, tried to beat him. People tried to kill him. People had him arrested. He was shipwrecked, and while he was shipwrecked, he was bit by a poisonous snake. He had plenty of things go wrong that you might look and say, yeah, you can be unhappy about that, Paul. Yeah, you can complain about that, Paul, no problem. Listen to how Paul describes his ministry in 1 Corinthians 7. Listen to this. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 4. He says, our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. We are ridiculed. Even now we go hungry and thirsty and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and we have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash. Do you feel like you're treated like the world's garbage? Do you feel like you're treated like everybody's trash? The Apostle Paul did. And he was saying in all of those circumstances, find contentment. When he's writing the book of Philippians, he's actually in prison. So while he is in prison, he had to rely on other people to take care of his needs. Okay? And while he was in prison, he was also single. For those of us in the room that are single, the Apostle Paul was single. He understood singleness. He understood what it meant. He he writes in another spot in 1 Corinthians how the other missionaries and the other apostles, they have wives that that come along with them on their trips, but he doesn't have a wife to go with him. Um, He writes this about singleness in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, I wish that all of you were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. So the Apostle Paul considered singleness a gift. You might think, is there a return receipt for that gift? I don't want that gift. But, but he considers it a gift And the reason he considers it a gift is because he knows that it frees up a person to serve the Lord without distraction. So he calls singleness a gift. He sees it as a good circumstance that he could be content in. You know, if you were to read all of 1 Corinthians 7, I encourage you to do that. You know, take some time this week, read 1 Corinthians 7. You're gonna find out that as he describes singleness, he also says that singleness comes with an expectation that you will not be sexually active. In the Bible, singleness comes with the expectation of celibacy. Now, in today's world, to say that, internally, you gotta be going, you gotta be kidding me. How can you be content like that? You know, but the Apostle Paul, talking about singleness as a gift, he's content. He's content there living a life honoring God, serving the Lord, and he is the model of contentment as a single person. To those who are married, when I read uh, these verses in verse 12, it reminded me of my marriage vows, right? He says that he can be content when he's brought low and when he's abounding, when he has plenty and when he's hungry, when he has abundance and when he's facing need. He found contentment. Does that remind you of your wedding vows? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. To us married couples, he wants us to learn contentment. He wants us to be content as we fulfill that lifelong promise to our spouse. 
He wants us to have joy in the midst of every one of those circumstances. So the Apostle Paul, single, in jail, who had suffered a lot for his ministry, said that he learned he needed to be content in all of those circumstances. And he had challenging life circumstances. Learning contentment isn't easy. Learning how to have joy in every circumstance is not something we can do in our own strength. So, how do we get this contentment? In verse 13, we see that contentment comes through Christ's strength. Contentment comes through Christ's strength. Contentment is not something we can fake, right? It's not fabricated. You don't fake it until you make it. Um, we really can't pretend to be content, right? When people are pretending to be content, can't you see right through it? Can't you see that it's fake? And not only that, your own heart knows that you're not content. You're, you're doing your internal complaining, right? And so you know it. And of course, God, who knows your heart, knows that you're not content. You really cannot fake this. So in verse 13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You probably have heard that before, right? In the context, that's talking about being content. I can be content through Christ who gives me strength. It's not a sports slogan, right? It doesn't necessarily belong on athletic equipment or on a bumper sticker. If you have that on your bumper sticker, it means I can be content if I'm driving a clunker or a Corvette. It means I can be content if my air conditioning is working or not working in Lake Havasu in August, okay? It's about contentment, okay? If it's, if it's your sports slogan, it means I can be content if I win or if I lose. So first and foremost, Paul is saying that this secret of contentment comes from Christ, from finding the ability to rejoice in all circumstances because of Christ. So the first question I have for you, is Jesus in your life? Have you gotten to a point where you turn from your sin and living life your own way and fully trust in Jesus, all that he did on the cross and in his resurrection so that you can have this new life? So that one of the things that this new life means is this supernatural ability to be content. You have to come to a point where you surrender your own way and you trust in Christ and you call out to him as your savior, as your redeemer, because that is when he gives you his strength. That is when he gives you his spirit. That is when he gives you the ability to be content even in terrible circumstances. And once you're a follower of Jesus, I believe that Philippians 4 gives us some more steps on finding contentment. So let's take a look at these steps. In verse 5, okay, if you've got your Bible open, you can look at verse 5. Uh, just after he says, rejoice all the time, he says this, let your reasonableness be known to all, the Lord is at hand. So in order to be content, we need to see Jesus in all situations. See Jesus in all situations. When Paul says the Lord is at hand, that means God is near, Jesus is near. He is in every circumstance that we find ourselves in, Jesus is right there. And we need to see him there, and we need to see a bigger picture. So um, I started out telling you about my kids complaining at Walt Disney World. Uh, the rest of that story is this. We went to the Gulf Coast for a week after being in Walt Disney World, okay? I told you this was a dream vacation. Okay, so we were right on the beach um, on the Gulf Coast, and do you know what didn't happen? My kids didn't complain, not once. And all they had was sand, water, buckets, and a shovel. And there was no complaining. And you know why I think that is? Is because they got their vision on something bigger, better, and more beautiful, right? They had the beach, they had the ocean, and they had the freedom to enjoy it. 
we need to see God in our difficulties. We need to see a bigger picture. You know, the theme park is totally geared to distract you, right? It's like, what can we go do next? You know, on every corner, there's a vendor or a restaurant with delicious food being piped out to you, okay? Oh, I wanna eat that. As you walk along, there's stores lined with all kinds of cool things for kids. The whole point of the theme park is to distract you, to want, make you want more. But when you see something big and beautiful and you see something that's complete and you get to enjoy that freedom, you can be content. So see Jesus in your difficulty. Let's apply it to your relationships. Do you see Jesus in your relationships? Whether those relationships are good or bad, do you know that Jesus is working? Whether you have a special someone in your life or not, do you know that you have Jesus in your life? If you want to be content, you need to start to see Jesus in all of your circumstances. You need to remember that Jesus is at work in your singleness. He's at work, he's given you a gift so that you can undistractedly pursue his purpose and his plan for your life. If you've got a rocky relationship with a spouse, Jesus wants you to bring him into that relationship. He wants you to see him there, that he can provide peace for you, that he can be in the process of healing what is broken. The trial that in your humanness you want to complain about, Jesus wants to use it to produce hope, change, and joy. So let me encourage you to see him in every one of your circumstances because the Lord is at hand. Next to be content, we need to seek him for any need. Seek him for any need. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So, when you're going through difficult times, when the circumstances are bad, you need to go to God and you need to seek him for those needs. And in fact, that word supplication there actually means to um, plead fervently. It means to beg, right? So this is, this is a heart cry for God to come and help, for God to rescue. God knows the turmoil that you are in and in the midst of it, he wants you to pray. He wants you to ask him for what you need. So what things might make your relationship better? Maybe it's from Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Would love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, would those things make your relationships better? Think about your singleness, would it be better if you had more self-control? Ask God for it. He wants to give it to you. Would your marriage be better if there was more kindness in it? Ask God for it. He wants to give it to you. In whatever you need to get through your circumstance, seek him. And in the midst of seeking him, we also need to thank him for all that's good. So in Philippians 4, 6, it talks about as you're asking God in prayer, it says to do it with thanksgiving. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems hard to me, right? Because I am needing something and I'm asking for it, but at the same time, I'm also supposed to be thanking God. And that's difficult. So in trying to process how we can do that, I think we do that because we can thank God that in the midst of the need, we know he is working. The Bible promises that during trials, God is working for our good and his glory. There can be a number of ways that he's doing that. You know, he might be trying to teach you patience through a difficulty. He might be teaching you how to love better through this relationship. He might want you to find your peace and your purpose in him alone instead of in another person. Your situation might be so broken. You know, the, the Bible does not paint a picture that finding contentment is just ignoring the problems, okay? So your situation might be so broken that Jesus wants to redeem it 
through his amazing power, and only his power is going to do it. He might be leading you or a spouse to repent. If you're in a relationship that's so destructive, so abusive, so unrepentant, God might be leading that relationship to a place where it ends so that you can devote yourself fully to him. Maybe you're single and you know that the relationship you're in with somebody else is not honoring God. Maybe he's asking you to put him first and to end that. He is ready to be your redeemer. He's ready to be your healer. He's ready to be your sufficiency. Even when it seems dark, you can thank him that he can bring the light. Thank Jesus that he knows what you need. Thank him that he's eager to provide for you. Thank him that he is in the midst of that need. Thank him that he is able to meet the need that you have. Thank him that he will not leave you or forsake you even when you feel lonely and abandoned. So, finding contentment by seeing Jesus in all circumstances, seeking him for all needs, thanking him for all that's good, and finally, wait for him to provide. Wait for him to provide. Verses 10 and 14 paint this picture um, of Paul having to wait to be provided for by God. Listen to what he says in verse 10. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And then in verse 14, he says, yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. So remember, Paul is in prison and um, he needed people to bring him food. The government wasn't providing three meals a day for Paul. He had to wait for people to provide for him. And so Paul alludes to this period of time where the Philippians couldn't help him. The church in Philippi couldn't help him. But then they got to this point while Paul was waiting where they could again help. And he is thankful for that. And he, that process of learning contentment, I think was enhanced by the fact that he had to wait for his needs to be provided for. So one way to find joy when you're in a need, when you're in a difficulty, is to just think about this. God hasn't provided an answer yet. You're waiting on him. Are you married and you're waiting for a spouse to come to know the Lord or to walk more closely with the Lord? Rather than thinking to yourself, this is never going to happen, think it just hasn't happened yet. You're waiting for the Lord. Are you single and do you desire to be married? Rather than thinking to yourself, I'm never gonna get married, think I'm waiting on the Lord to provide the right person, the right marriage partner for me. And if it is his good plan and it's in his will, it will happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And I also want you to note where Paul found this contentment. His needs were met in the context of the church family. It was the church that came alongside of him when he had a need. It was the relationships there where he found ability to be content in very difficult circumstances. You know, um, we've been doing a new life group series for the last three weeks on marriage and singleness. And through that life group series, what I have seen and I've heard is some awesome stories of how God has provided through those life groups. I know of couples that have gotten married because they met at life group, right? They met at life group and then they got married. They got married in their life group meeting. Not just one, there's multiple of these types of stories. I know stories of women who were waiting and praying for their husbands to come to know the Lord or to walk with the Lord more closely. And that happened by the wife faithfully attending a life group and then finally the husband going with her and going, oh, I need Jesus. And committing his life to follow Jesus. God will likely provide for your need, especially your relational need, through the community of the church. You need to get plugged in. You need to have relationships. 
So let me encourage you. We're halfway through the series, but join us tomorrow night for the single study. We'll be back here in this room at 6.30. If you're single, just show up. Come, be a part of it, okay? If you're married, uh, come on Tuesday night, 6.30, this room. Come and be a part of what's going on and start to meet some other people and find encouragement in your relationship. Here is the point. Waiting on the Lord and being in the place where he is working, his church, is a way to learn contentment. So I ask you, have you learned the secret of being content? Do you know that you need to rely on God's strength so that you can find joy in all circumstances? Can you see Jesus in whatever circumstance you're in? Can you seek him and thank him for whatever needs you fa you're facing? Can you wait on him to provide for you? Because he promises he will. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the fact that you are great and mighty and uh, there is no need that we have that you can't provide for. So Lord, today we come and we just confess we're really good at complaining we're really good at finding things that make us unhappy. But Lord, we want to find ease in you. We want to find joy in you. We want to find contentment in you. So Lord, would you help us? Help us to see you in all of the difficulties. Help us to seek you when we're facing a need. Help us to thank you because you're walking with us in that dark valley and help us to wait for you to provide for us. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.